You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, where we talk about using nootropics, biohacking, and nutrition to help you boost your cognition. My name is Eric. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner. And today on the podcast, I have Dr. Aaron Hartman. Dr. Aaron is a functional medicine doctor. He is a clinical researcher. He's a professor. He is a farmer, and he is a father as well. He is the jack of all trades. Welcome, Dr. Hartman, to the Holistic Nootropics podcast. Eric, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting. I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'm very excited to chat with you because you seem to have a foot in a lot of different areas that I'm very interested in. You know, like in this biohacking space, you know, I find that everybody is so focused on only functional medicine and everything that traditional medicine has to say is kind of bunk and it's, you know, it's it's corporate shilling and it's, you know, you're a, you're a, uh, you know, you're a puppet for big pharma. And then, you know, if you're over here in the functional medicine world, you're like a, you're like a quack doc, you believe in, you know, ashwagandha can cure cancer. And, uh, and then meanwhile, you know, you've got a foot in both spaces and you do, uh, uh, you have a very well referenced site for a lot of important, um, you know, companies and, uh, you know, you, you do a lot of these things within the medicinal, uh, world. So, you know, I, I find your story very interesting and I want to get into it, but before we do, I'd love to know how you got interested in medicine to begin with. I mean, my, my story about getting in medicine is kind of, um, pretty boring, actually. I mean, I just was, you know, in fourth grade and I saw our country family doc talking to my mom and, you know, he's, he asked her some questions and put a stethoscope on her back and chatted. And then there was an old country doc place. So you went to the front desk and you paid $3 for your medications and, you know, $5 for the office visit. And I was like, I can do that. And so I just kind of like decided I want to do that at a, at a, a young age. I think, you know, where my story gets interesting is how I got into the functional medicine side. And that's with my family. My wife is actually a pediatric occupational therapist whose specialty was kids with special needs. And, um, we um, eventually, she asked if we wanted to like adopt one of the patients, which is which was one of her patients, my daughter Anna. So we took Anna into my home when she was about a year old, and um, that's when we kind of, you know, I was already a doctor at that point in time, and that's when we kind of got hit in the face with how the healthcare system deals with people with chronic health issues or things they can't take care of. And um, my daughter was supposedly underweight for her age, and the GI doctor recommended us putting a plastic feeding tube in her stomach that um, would help her gain weight. And so knowing how that would affect speech, how it affect crawling, you know, our goals were her to her to mature and be the best her she could be, you know, even though they said she'd never walk or talk or all that kind of stuff. And so we just opted out of that. And six months later, my wife found a growth chart where my daughter was right in the middle of the growth chart for kids with cerebral palsy. And so that was the first time the light bulb went off in my head that maybe the experts don't know everything. And so, you know, magnify that over 15 years with just Every time there's been a surgical procedure recommended and we thought it wasn't right for her, we've kind of gone off the course. We've gone to Canada for therapy. We've researched with um, practitioners in Russia. And um, my daughter's 15 now and she's walking with forearm crutches and she, we kind of joke she won't stop talking. <laughs> um, she loves playing cards. And it's just interesting to see like our path was hard. It was a lot of work, but it was like, you know, it's interesting to see how, how many kids in the special needs world, how many patients with hard diagnoses are, are just kind of stuck in this rut and there's other things that can be done for them. And that's um, kind of what got me into the functional medicine world. I also do clinical research. And so I, there's answers out there and I just, I don't like taking no for an answer, you know? And so I just have always pushed the um, envelope and when I get stuck, I just look for a new, a new route. And I've been doing that for almost, almost 20 years now. And it's interesting that that's a major part of your story is, is your daughter's story, because um, I am finding doing this podcast, especially, which is that a lot of doctors, a lot of practitioners who get into this space, uh, into like the functional health space, the holistic health space, um, it is because the mainstream, uh, the mainstream medicine world failed them in some way, and they were forced to do their own me search, you know, and, and, and I do find it interesting that in the mainstream health space, they find it, you know, they find it uh, abhorrent that you would opt to not get surgery, 
right? That you would want to do something other than, you know, cutting somebody open, right? <laughs> and, uh, or, or medicating them with substances that have more side effects than actual positive effects. Um, so, so I find, I find your story very uh, appropriate for a, a lot of other stories I've heard like that. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's interesting because like when I, when I told you about that story, like we actually reported to Child Protective Services for refusing health care. And so when the rep came out, the nurse came out to our house to investigate us, it was interesting because my wife had already worked with her with other patients because, again, my wife is an occupational therapist. So she came out, did due diligence. We were a little anxious, but they saw that we were doing what's best for our, our, our daughter. But it was just kind of interesting how, like, my, I'm a physician. My wife is, is an occupational therapist. Like, what does the average person do who doesn't have that knowledge basis, who doesn't know how to go through, how do they, you know, um, navigate all this when someone says, no, you have to do what I say, cause I'm the expert, you know? And um, that's what I want to do is like let people know there's other options, other ways. And um, you know, um, you don't just have to do what the expert says. Cause a lot of times they don't actually know everything. I'm so shocked like that the experts don't know everything, you know, and they still, they still accept that title of expert and, you know, they wear it around. And, um, and I, I just, I feel like so many doctors um, and I've, I've had several conversations in different, for different reasons with several different doctors uh, recently in pertaining to different, areas of health. I'm being very ambiguous for a reason, but um, I, I, I was amazed because for instance, I was at a doctor and it wasn't for me, it was for somebody else. And they recommended, they're like, you know, you should, you should take a, a multivitamin. And, uh, or they, they said, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend you a multivitamin, go to Walgreens and pick up one of these Centrum 100 multivitamins. And it was like, first of all, the person that I was there with takes uh, high quality supplements already. They take, you know, something that are provider uh, branded supplements. They take them, you know, strategically. They don't take multivitamins. Um, and if they did, they would take a multivitamin that isn't filled with so much stuff. I don't know if you've seen the label for a Centrum uh, 100 multivitamin, but uh, man, does it have a lot of extra crap in there other than the stuff you actually need? Do you know what they call those vitamins? When I was in the hospital, they used to call those vitamins bedpan pills because grandma would take her pills. She'd be in the hospital. I'd be taking care of her as a hospitalist and go right through her and pop out in the bedpan. And you look at that, and one of the greens you'll see is um, either zinc or titanium dioxide as a coating. Wow. It's a, it's a metallic coat. And then if you have low stomach acid, you won't break it down. And guess who takes most of the centrum in our country? It's the older population, centrum silver, right? And so all of a sudden, you know, it's like, I, the, the idea is good, but just the product's not the best, you know? And so that's where you did, even something's comp, something simple as vitamin C, you know, what's the base? Is it a corn base? Is it a beet base? Is it a root base? You know, is it, is it ascorbic acid? Is it buffered vitamin C? Is it liposomal vitamin C? I'm finding that nutrition is more complicated than pharmacology, you know? And that's where I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, even something as simple as vitamin C, there's multiple different types, different forms, and even different sources. You know, my wife, for example, can't tolerate most buffered vitamin C because of their corn based. And so the one we use is actually based from a root from South America. Um, she has an issue with corn, you know? And so it's interesting how a lot of these things are more complicated than just take your multi and move on with your life, you know? Yeah. When you, when you start jumping into the supplements and then you start seeing that, uh, yeah, like for instance, vitamin C, uh, it, much of it is made from, uh, you know, from corn base. So many supplements are filled with soy, you know, or, or made with soy are filled with wheat. And then people have these gluten allergies, uh, or their celiac, whatever, but yet they're popping supplements that are, you know, have wheat flour in them or like different allergens or, you know, even worse, like these, uh, the, the food coloring things, right. That, you know, actually, uh, are terrible for your brain. That's the least that I know. Um, I'm sure they're bad for other parts of your body as well. And, you know, that just flies completely under the radar and I, I don't blame people. I just think it's such a lack of awareness, but such an important part. And I say this all the time. It's why the supplement industry is a hundred billion dollar industry yet, you know, people are sicker than ever because these supplements, most of them just don't work. I think one of the things we, before we went on, one of the things you're talking about, you know, ultimately supplements by definition supplement. So what do they supplement? They supplement a high quality diet. They, su they supplement clean food, clean water, clean air. You know, if your diet is terrible, if you're eating 
processed foods and processed oils and tons of sugar and not sleeping and don't exercise and work out, then I'm not sure the supplement's going to do that much for you because they, by definition, they supplement, you know, and that's where I feel like a lot of people use supplements as like green allopathy instead of taking my diabetes medication, I'm going to take my berberine or whatever. It's like, well, the foundational things are still foundational and you got to focus on the main thing and, and supplements can help, but they ultimately just supplement your main lifestyle stuff you should be doing. Yeah. The multivitamin and McDonald's person, you know, it, it's like, uh, Hey, I skipped breakfast. I had a big, you know, lunch McDonald's, but I took, I took my, you know, multivitamin. So, and my drink, my diet Coke. So I'm good to go. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, do you find it like, uh, I, I almost feel like it's, it's almost criminally negligent. The fact that we don't teach kids in school how to eat properly. You know, like we feed kids such crap out of the cafeteria. And then you see the things that parents put in their kids' lunch boxes. And then, you know, I feel like this just kind of grows over time where you just don't really understand the fundamentals of like good nutrition. And being that we both know it's so important, um, you know, by the time somebody starts dealing with the health issues that come with some of these disorders, you know, 20s, 30s, maybe even your 40s, uh, it, it's a very difficult ship to turn around at that point. I mean, well, you, I agree with that, but it's also really amazing how much you're body wants to heal. I've seen patients with diabetes for years, health issues for years, just make basic dietary changes and lifestyle changes and see their health dramatically change in a short period of time. It just, it's like your body was made. It wants to be better. It just take away the things it shouldn't be exposed to, right? You give it the things it needs to heal. And a lot of times it just kind of fixes itself. And that's where, and then supplements can be helpful because while well, you're inflamed, so that, and you've got some joint issues, so let's throw some collagen hydroxylate peptides and some curcumin in there and you got your know, gut issues. So let's work on some of the microbial mixture with different herbs and stuff. But it's just interesting how our bodies, you know, were designed or made to self heal. And if we give them the right things, they actually will change course. And it's just, I think the thing that amazes me is how many years you can eat bad food. How many, how many years does it take to get diabetes from eating bad food? And the answer is decades, you know, it's just amazing that it takes such a long time when you eat processed oils that are rancid, you know, trans fats, you know, if you look at margarine, you know, what's margarine? Margarine is partially plasticized vegetable oil. It's a semi-solid, right? Like there's some, pla there's all kinds of plastic objects around us, right? We take petroleum, and we plasticize them. That's what margarine is, right? And yet you eat that for years. It takes years for you to get ill from that. I'm like, I put the wrong gasoline. I put diesel in my gas car. It's done, right? But our bodies are just so much smarter and can work and work the way around that. And that's why I think the human, you know, we're not, we're not machines. We're, we're complex interconnected organisms that interact with the information, the food, the information, environment. you know, the, the whole idea of genetics that I, was one thing that's kind of interesting to me, like the whole genetic movement where, you know, we map the human genome and there's you know, 23,000 genes in your, in your, um, your, your body, your chromosomes, right? There's frogs that are more genetically complicated than, than you, Eric, right? But why can you think and walk and talk and do all these kind of things? Because this microbiome is a million genes in the bacteria and on your body. And all of a sudden now, your phenotype or your expression, your personal your physiology expression is not just your genes. It's, your, it's these things that live in and on your body. And that degree of complexity allows humans to live anywhere on the planet, you know, from, north, from the North Pole area to the South Pole to the the Mediterranean area or it allows our diets to vary. What's a perfect diet? You know, if you're in Okinawa, it's going to be different than if you're Sardinia. It's going to be different if you're in Loma Linda and Nicoya, um, coast, um, um, Costa Rica. But these are all different blue zones where people live to be 100 years, right? And that's why I think just giving our bodies real food um, in the right situation, it, it's amazing how powerful food is medicine. It's amazing how powerful that can be. And so, you know, when you see a lot of these people come into your practice and, and, you know, you're able to kind of help them get back on the right track, I don't want to say reverse, I'm sure you do help reverse a lot, but I'm sure there's, there's a lot of people who are works in progress. Um, you know, when it comes to food, like, what do you see people's biggest um, problem with food is? I think people don't understand where food comes from. Like, if you understand the process of planting a seed in the soil. You need soil that is 
diverse that has the right kind of bacteria and um, fungi in it to break down the minerals so that the plant can be healthy. They don't understand the whole the whole process of um, of reaping a crop and how it gets to where they're at. We don't understand. You know, we, we used to be int intimately connected with our food. You know, you go in the backyard, you lived on a farm, you went to a local farmer's market, you talked with the fish guy, the fish monger, you talked with the cheese monger, you know, you talked with that person who specialized in their grains and you, you talked about where it came from. You actually knew where your feed, food was coming from. You knew how it got to you. Um, and you knew how long it last. You knew what the life was. And we've just been disconnected with, um, with, our nutrition. And so what happens is people don't understand that the hydroponic, you know, tomato that was grown in the middle of the wintertime, hanging upside down um, with just vitamin water is not the, is not the same as the tomato they grow in their backyard in the middle of summer. People recognize the taste difference. Everybody knows the tomato in your backyard tastes better, but they don't understand what that actually means nutritionally. And that's where I feel like, you know, the educational aspect is kind of hard when we've been disassociated from food sourcing. There's, there's a guy, Joe South, and he's a um, big organic farmer here in um, Virginia. And he's written a bunch of books and he kind of, he kind of jokes about, he, he has people come to his farm all the time. He jokes about having kids, high school kids come to his farm. They get off the bus and like, where's the salsa tree? And it's like, uh, and he has to explain to him salsa is made of guacamole and tomatoes and cilantro and olive oil and a little lime. And yeah. And he has to go through this whole process of like, where, you know, where does that thing come from? And that's, that's, how do you address that? That's a huge, huge thing to tackle, you know? Yeah. And, and so many people eat these f like prepackaged foods, right? That uh, like seem, I don't know. I just don't think it's like you said, people understand like where these things come from, like a box of mac and cheese. Like that's not food. That's it. You can put it in your mouth. You can put it, run it down your digestive tract. Um, you know, you could poop it out kind of, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's not really food. And I find that like all of these things in the middle of the grocery store, box foods, bagged foods, you know, jarred foods. Um, we, we call those foods, but they're really not food. They really don't come from anything from nature. And, uh, essentially they're filled with all of the stuff that actually, uh, is detrimental to most people's health. Yeah. And one thing you kind of mentioned before we started recording, we we're talking briefly is the idea of food being information. And it's really interesting. Like people don't realize there's this thing called, I think everybody now knows what um, mRNA is because of the COVID vaccine, right? Well, people don't realize, you know, you go in your backyard and you pull some arugula out of your garden. It has micro RNA actually in that plant. You take that and you eat that plant, you're actually eating signaling molecules in the saliva living plant that then signals the bacteria in your gut, it signals the cells in your GI tract. If you take that, that plant and you heat it, you can it, you process it, you strip it of most of the nutrients when you, if for wheat, for example, when you take off the hull or, you know, with, with milk, when you homogenize and pasteurize it, you make, you force water and oil to mix. That's what homogenization is. It's forcing water and oil to mix. It changes the chemistry of that. Well, you know, it's just eating simple, basic food that's much more complexly with information you know, the phytosterols or the, or the plant chemicals that actually signal our DNA become destroyed in part of the cooking and processing. So it's not just, you know, the macros of protein and fat and carbs or the micros with minerals. It's this, these, all these plant chemicals that make, you know, arugula green and make the tomato red and make, you know, your blueberries blue. Those actually have value. And people, I think most people are familiar with resveratrol, which is one of the many, you know, it's, the, it's what makes grapes red, but that color concept of nutrition applies to every colored plant, whether it's white and onions or it's, you know, the red on the peel of an apple. And so in the, pro the process of processing food destroys almost all of those. Man, I, I, I never heard it put like that where, uh, you know, to break down something like a vegetable, like arugula and say, it's not just the nutrients in the arugula, but it's also these micro uh, organisms that are a part of the, you know, uh, that are a part of the plant itself that interact with your own body. That actually is where so much of that nutrition comes from. Well, I mean, if you want to get a little, this is where I kind of geek out a little bit, you know, I, I really love getting the science of like, you know, I, I have my own cows and I have my own, you know, my own little farm kind of stuff, but okay. You have a mom who has a baby, she's breastfeeding. She goes in her backyard and pulls some salad out of her garden. There's, there's soil-based organisms. Have you ever heard of soil-based organisms before? They're fancy new probiotics. 
Well, some of those soil based organisms are actually on that green that she pulls up. She takes it inside, makes it, eats it. It actually gets in her blood and she secretes small amounts of these probiotics, these bacteria in her breast milk, which then help train her child's immune system. You know, and it's interesting because we all knew that fact 100 years ago. Because if you've ever heard of clabbered milk, you know, little Miss Muffet sat on her tuppet eating her curds and whey. But what is that? That's cow's milk raw that you let sit and the bacteria and enzymes in it start to digest the milk and it separates out the curds and whey. And you can actually take the curds, which are now a, a soft cheese and make a thing called cork out of them. This all, a lot of these things are just, the, that's the interaction of a cow eating grass, getting those bacteria in its gut, ruminating. It works its way to its milk, which then works its way to your, you know, your GI tract. There's this close connectedness between us and the soil and the plants that grow in the soil and our environment. And we start sterilizing everything like the soil. We start sterilizing all your food, okay? We start sterilizing all the objects around you. You're breaking that connectivity. And that's actually where a lot of infections come from. People don't realize that, you know, you know, every, you know most people are colonized with staph or strep or mycoplasma pneumonia or hemophysis influenza, all these other bacteria, right? In our skin, so there's staph on your skin. Well, why don't you get chronic skin infections? Because you have enough healthy bacteria in your own bacterial microbiome that suppresses growth of these disease causing bacteria. And we start sterilizing the food process and the environment, it sets us up for chronic disease. And that's where a lot of the data and the literature is now going with the whole gut, gut connection health with the human microbiome. We need healthy bacteria to balance our immune system, to balance our hormones. You know, half of all pharmaceutical drugs are actually broken down and detoxified by the bacteria in your gut. Some of the research I'm involved with with different pharmaceuticals, you know, one of the things is to figure out how can we, you know, how does your gut bacteria affect the medications people take, right? And that degree of interconnectedness, once we start sterilizing everything and, and creating fake foods, we're, we're blocking this natural um, progress that we've been a part of for millennia. That's the, I, I've been so into gut bacteria for a, a, a while now, you know, that was kind of like my own tra like health transformation was around uh, mm -hmm. gut bacteria. And, you know, for me, it's not just a meme. It's like a way of life. You know, it's the real thing because I've experienced it myself. I see it with other people. I also see the opposite effect. Like, you know, I know people who will take a round of antibiotics and then shortly after that, they'll get that staph infection. They'll get uh, SIBO. Um, I've seen people get and, uh, I was reading this thing recently that, uh, in fact, the CDC even recognizes that 71% of, um, I might mess this stat up, but 71% of people who use antibiotics develop uh, Clostridium difficile. So, uh, you know, so it's a major, um, so, so something like antibiotics and wiping out the bacteria in your gut, uh, it's a major problem. And uh, antibiotics are uh, completely overprescribed by most doctors. Well, I think there's, you know, we, you know, we, you know, there's this disconnect between different fields of medicine, different fields of study, and even, even agriculture and veterinary medicine. You know, um, farmers have been giving antibiotics in cow feed and chicken fields since the 1950s when you realize that antibiotics in the feed make the cow grow quicker, make the chicken grow faster, right? You know, every glass of milk you get from your store has about a 15 microgram equivalents of an antibiotic in it that the, that the um, cows are giving through this whole process. And we're seeing now childhood obesity on the, the rise. Half of Americans are, are overweight or, or obese. And it's interesting how we can, one field of you know, agribusiness realizes antibiotics in the food system actually make animals grow faster and fatter. But then on the human side, we're like, oh, antibiotics, take all you want, won't affect your health. I'm like, there's a massive disconnect, you know? And that's where, you know, just educating people. That there's a reason why organic food is healthier for you and grass-fed, grass-fed beef is healthier for you. And it's more than just what the cow eats. It's the whole process of like how the cow gets to your to the store, what it's fed before, you know? Think about cows, for example. Cows are ruminators, they ferment. What happens when you ferment grain and, and corn? You make alcohol, right? Well, that's when um, grain-fed cows are actually creating low levels of alcohol and they get, you know, marble and they get fatty muscle, they get fatty liver. You, you and I and us, that's pre-diabetes or diabetes. And a cow, that's high quality meat that goes to the high-end stores. And it's just this massive disconnect with how all these things interconnect. And you can taste the difference in cows and animals that are raised on a, you know, sustainably, uh, you know, sustainably built farm versus like one of these CAFOs or come from these commercial places where they are, you know, 
pumped full of antibiotics and they eat a diet that's not native to the animal. Um, I mean, you can taste the difference. I eat from, you know, the meat I get is from a, a local farm here in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's, it's almost like, uh, like what I'll eat a steak and then the next day I'll just have insane amounts of energy. It almost feels like I woke up and had like three cups of coffee from the steak I ate the night before and I didn't have coffee that day. So, uh, yeah, food is, food is information, food is energy. And, you know, the things that take away from that, you know, they, they drain your energy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hippocrates, the father of, you know, modern medicine back whatever it was, the eighth or seventh century, whatever, you know, millennia ago said that, you know, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. We've lost that, that mooring, so to speak. And it's really interesting because like when you're talking about with the meat you eat, you know, naturally raised meat or chicken or whatever, it's more nuanced. And so the way you cook, you know, you, you cook the meat from a flank different than you cook a tenderloin, different than you cook hamburger. And a lot of those nuances, you know, when we raise our own cows and based on when I raise it, if I, if I process a cow in the fall, that's going to have more nutrient dense um, meat because it's been eating, you know, microgreens all summer because I rotate it every week and put it on fresh growing pasture. If you butcher that in the spring, it's coming off of having all this um, water dense plant. And so there's a lot of water in the meat. Versus if I butcher in the middle of winter time, it's been on straw for all winter. And it's interesting, all these nuances you don't get in commercial meat. That's, yeah, it, that's what we need. We need more. We, it, it's amazing that we're not pushing kids to be farmers. You know, we're not pushing people to, because there's a huge opportunity, I, I think. Um, and there's probably more than enough land in the U S it's just that, uh, you know, without going too far off on the tangent of like all the problems with the industrial meat, um, you know, industry, it's like, Look, it's a problem that has a solution. And I've heard, I've seen the research on regenerative agriculture and I've tasted the meat it myself. I know the health benefits of it all. It's just crazy how it's like, you still go to the store and there's like the meat, you know, if you're in New York City, it came from uh, California, right? Or it came from uh, Oklahoma or something. Well, there's interesting data um, looking at, you know, urinary tract infections in women. And there's a, there's a correlation with, consuming chicken and urinary tract infections in women. So when I see someone who's had multiple UTIs, who's younger, I'm like, how much chicken are you eating? And it's interesting how much E. coli and other bacteria are on that chicken in the store after it's been washed with bleach. You know, it's interesting that the eggs in the store are irradiated. You know, why do they need to be irradiated? Because of all the bacteria in these chicken coops. I've got chickens back here. I get my eggs out. I wipe them off. I put them in my countertop. You know, I don't have to irradiate them and bleach them. Well, why is that? Because it's a different, I've got 15 chickens in a two acre plot. I don't have 20,000 chickens in a plot the size of a big house, you know? And so it's just, all these things affect the quality of what we eat. And ultimately, you know, if according to the uh, research from the University of Florida, half of all chronic disease in our country can be directly attributed to eating processed foods. So half of everything I see on a daily basis, and this is New major university, conservative university, this is not, you know, anything fringe. Harvard School of Public Health, okay, Walter Willett, probably one of the top epidemiologists in the country. He says 80% of heart disease and 70% of cancer can be prevented by diet and lifestyle alone. So all of a sudden, you know, half of all chronic disease, 80% of heart disease, 70% of cancer is preventable. Like that's, to me, mind boggling. You know, if I do my job well, I won't have one, right? <laughs> Yeah. And that's the, you know, uh, not to say that I think most doctors are like, you know, complicit in like, hey, I have to keep my patients sick. I just don't think many understand like what you just said. You know, I think I think many understand that, hey, diet's important. But like what always kind of frustrates me is, is like, you know, a regular like a standard kind of doctor patient interaction. That's what, like six to eight minutes long. And then, you know, if the patient is overweight, the doctor will say, well, you got to work on your diet. And then the patient says, well, you know, what do I need to do? And, you know, uh, the mainstream kind of info on diet is, well, 
eat less. Right. And then, but it doesn't say anything about like processed food or micronutrients or, uh, you know, food sourcing or toxins or, you know, all these other things. It's just like, uh, you know, eat more salads or whatever. Right. Even though like the, the, the ingredients you get for a salad could be also completely tainted with things like glyphosate or, uh, you know, uh, whatever else comes up, if it's packaged in plastic, let's say, and it's been sitting out in a hot truck or whatever, plastic leaches onto the vegetables, whatever it is. Um, I think these nuances are, are missing from the mainstream conversation. Well, I think it's also hard. You know, our, our current medical system was built on acute care, right? You come in with pneumonia, we have these magical things called antibiotics. You know, people forget that um, a quarter of kids die before they made it to 12 years of age because of infectious diseases. You know, people forget that anywhere from a quarter to a third of women would die in childbirth from some kind of peripheral fever, right? These, these things that don't happen anymore. And so we had these magical things of antibiotics, acute care changed the whole course of medicine. And our model today, you know, now we're dying of chronic illnesses that require more time and more, more content work, but our system is still built around acute episodes of care. You come in with chronic fatigue, fibro, headaches, whatever. And I've got to give you an acute diagnosis for acute treatment and get you out. And I'm a little more generous. I try to get people 10 to 12 minutes, right? But the, the reality is the time is too short to talk about all the complexities of, of whatever is going on with you because our system's still built around this acute episode of care model. And that's where, you know, how do we jump ship? You know, that's one of the, the conversations I have with a lot of my colleagues from a business perspective. You know, when, you're, when your business is, you know, is based on insurance reimbursement and insurance say you have to see 25 to 30 people a day. You have to document these things. You have to report these things. You have to do things a certain way. You know, all of a sudden, like I'm just basically limited in time. And when someone comes in, I don't have time to talk about diet and exercise. You know, I can't, in our local area in Richmond, we have, I think the um, catch population here is about 1.2 million people in the, in the metro areas, plus or minus. Um, I can't find a nutritionist that will accept insurance to talk about diet unless you're a diabetic. And there's only two or three places in town that will even see those patients because the reimbursement's so low. So, you know, if diet's such a big deal and, but insurance doesn't reimburse for me even to send you to a nutritionist, you have to be willing to pay out of pocket. You know, that's, that's, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. I'm so happy you mentioned that um, because I used to work. Uh, I used to work as a collector for a um, medical provider of um, durable medical equipment, and I would collect from insurance companies. And the dance that you do to get an insurance company just to pay a bill, um, you know, the insurance company, the doc. The, I think there's faults on both sides, but I, like the the. I, I don't know, even know where to begin with like the problem with the insurance companies, but uh, you definitely touched on a problem that is, I think, one of the fundamental problems in the overall healthcare system, um, and it really cripples, you know, good doctors like yourself. Like, like you said, like you're giving ten to twelve minutes, you know, when a typical other doctor gives six to eight. And I say six to eight, and I'm kind of making it sound like, oh, well, that doctor doesn't care. I'm sure that doctor cares a lot, but he's also exhausted. He's overworked. He's under researched, and he just doesn't know the care to give to somebody who he knows keeps coming in, and every time they see him, they're sicker and sicker and sicker and yeah, their hands are tied and all they can do is give them uh, a medicine that again, might not be helping the overall situation. I mean, another thing that's interesting, if you look at the European system versus our system, it's not to say one's better, they're just different, you know. Um, the European system is not as based on paying for procedures. And so what you see play out is about 75% of physicians in Europe um, are primary care specialists. And twenty and a quarter are you know uh, you know cardiologists, rheumatologists, etc. You know, in the United States is the exact opposite, where seventy five percent of doctors are specialists. You know, all your fields, and and twenty five percent are in the primary care. And it's interesting how if we have a system that pays for procedures, we get a lot of proceduralists. You know, and so it's interesting how you know I think you know I've I've never I personally I've not met a physician who's a crook. I've not met a physician who's uncaring, uncompassionate. And to your point, Eric, that they're stressed, we're working hard. But when the system actually pays for procedures, like with my daughter, she saw the GI doctor. I'm sure the GI doctor didn't mean any harm, but in her mind, for what my daughter needed was a procedure. 
not be willing to spoon feed her every night and figure out how can I help her be, be healthier. You know, and that's, that's where I think of the conversation has to be outside of insurance and outside of the government. It has to be more like this where, you know, a ground, a ground level where people get educated enough that they say, wait a second, I want, I want better. And they have to, and they have to be willing to put a little bit of their skin in the game, you know, because ultimately insurance is they're all trying to cut costs. That's just the way companies sold on the S&P 500, their purpose. It took me years to really understand this and believe it, but the purpose of any company sold on the S&P 500 is to create value for its shareholders. And in these big insurance companies, their primary purpose is not to provide healthcare, is to create value for their shareholders. And so I think we're, that's just, that's just part of a systemic issue. And I think we have to jump ship. That's, that's where I think direct primary care, kind of shares medicine, um, fee for service, these things, these old things need to kind of come back. And those who are willing to in, invest a little more in their health um, can do that. And then the people that have more, that have, that have more poverty and more lack of access to care, then the government can kind of come in and focus on those people. But the, the more, if we stick a certain amount of money and spread it over 330 million people, that's going to be very, very little for each person. And we can't really get individualized care in this era of science and individualized care. We're getting just mass population-based care. And if anything, the last year with COVID has taught us with, with you know, with population-based medicine. That's what population-based medicine is. I'm, I'm going to make recommendations for 330 million people. Mm-hmm. But that, that recommendation, Eric, will not apply to you because you're a guy in Puerto Rico. And this recommendation for the average male, female, multi-ethnic, multi-age person, these people don't exist in the real world. You know, individuals exist in the real world. That's the, oh man, that's, a, and, and then they do, you know, the, like the general sweeping recommendations for everybody. And it's like the, the, the food pyramid or the, the, my plate or whatever, right. It's like, everybody should eat this diet, right. Everybody should take, uh, you know, these medications, everyone should get this vaccine. Everybody should do this. And it's like, like, uh, how is it that, uh, that diversity is so celebrated. Like we're all different, but yet we all have to comply to the same constrictions. Yet our biochemistry means so much, but it also means so little to the regulators, right? Like it means yeah. so much to, you know, a woke, like a woke bank, but <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to where it should actually mean something, which is the healthcare system. Yeah. And that's what I think, you know, functional medicine practitioners, what, we, what we're good at is talking to a person you know, ask people where they grew up, ask people what country they're from, um, what their ethnicity is, I ask them about their obviously blood pressure and weight and those kind of things. I ask them about their history of trauma, I ask them about their food, I ask them about, I try to learn as much as I can about that person in the two hours I see them when I do an intake, because I realize that that individual in front of me is a product of not only their past history, but their parents and their grandparents. There's actually this thing called transgenerational epigenetic priming. Okay, what that means is when a when mom was a egg inside of grandma, uh, it's when, sorry, mom was inside, when, when a little girl was inside her mom, when her mom was inside of grandma, what grandma was being exposed to was actually genetically priming the granddaughter for that same environment. And we have data from that from World War II, either from Mao's China or from the, um, the uh, Dutch bread famines. Um, women who were from upper, upper class, upper middle class who had access to a lot of food who were starving those kids, if they went back to that same upper class and they grew up in that environment, plenty of access to food, had higher obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular issues. If they were from lower income, food scarcity, and they, it was more scarce, they were primed for austerity, but they grew up with normal outcomes because they were in these poor situations. They have access to tons of calories and tons of food. So it's interesting how, in my world, I actually don't just look at you. I look at your family, your kids, you know, your spouse your spouse, your, your parents, like where you grew up. It's amazing how many cancers, how many heart, how much heart disease, how much diabetes is actually the environment you grew up in. And that's, that's just, you can't apply that degree of individual specialized care in a 12 minute time slot. Yeah. And that's so interesting. The transgenerational, um, would you call it transition generational epigenetic priming? Yes. Yeah. So we're, 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 and I'm not sure how familiar you are, you know, the whole idea of genes, you know, the very reductionistic thinking that you're a big machine with a bunch of cogs and I figure out which cog is broken, I can fix you. With the human, you know, genome project, what we, what we found out was like, we're genetically simple. There's only about 23,000 genes in your genome, plus or minus, you know. But there's a million genes in your microbiome you're talking about, you're alluding to with the bacteria in and on your, and there's a virome. Now we realize that the viral genes, you know, eight, anywhere from 8% of your genome, plus or minus, is actually viral. 
So now all of a sudden you are more than just your genes, you're a sampling of the bacteria and virus in your environment. And that's a crazy thing to think about. And this idea of epigenetic priming is the environment, ep on top of the genome, the environment actually affects your phenotype, your height, you know, your, your, your intelligence, your ability to handle stress. Now we're learning about this microbiome with kids with autism, um, pandas, uh, kids with ADHD. We're learning about how the gut microbiome, <clears throat> when you're an infant, affects neurological development. That is so cool, but it's also, because it means there's things I can do for these patients that, you know, have no quote unquote treatment options. But at the same time, it's, it's daunting because it means what we're doing today is going to affect our children and grandchildren of tomorrow. And we need to kind of get on it, you know? Yeah, that's the scary thing. I think about this all the time. Um, uh, environmental toxins, right? All these different chemicals we're just surrounded by. Like we just kind of take them day by day. We don't realize like the little dents they're making in our armor every day. Like, okay, we don't feel it. We don't feel the chemical, uh, you know, the, the chemical con uh, concoction that makes up, you know, uh, like the paint in our walls or the, the, uh, the smoke in the air that we breathe, you know, like I lived in New York city for years, like the brake dust and like living by gas stations and by the airport and just mm. constant cars and smells and all these things. Um, but that's going into my body. It's being stored somewhere. Um, and that information is going to get passed down to uh, my children, who's going to pass it down to their children. And by that point, like, who knows? Who knows what, what the generations will look like? Well, it's interesting you mentioned New York because um, there's an article um, that I po posted on, public, um, on social media probably last summer talking about air, air quality and COVID. And what we knew last summer was areas that have a higher air pollution, New York City, Lombardy, Italy, which is actually an industrial center in Italy, Wuhan province in China. You know, there's a direct correlation with inhalational exposure to these microparticles called PM 2.5, which are, you know, all, like you, what you mentioned, all the dust from industrial stuff with lung inflammation, bumping up this thing called the ACE2 receptor, which made it easier for the COVID virus to get in people's lungs. All of a sudden, the environment in those, in th those areas was a, direct, was a direct correlate with severity of COVID. And that's where, you know, I really kind of geek out. I love this kind of stuff because get a HEPA filter. You know, how do you filter out 99.97% of all these microparticulates? The filter I've got on the floor right here that I'm basically got on 24 seven. It's like, so I'm, I'm not scared by this stuff. I'm actually excited about it because for me as a practitioner, it's, it gives me information, things I can do to help you, you know, to help my patients. Like, hey, look, try this. Um, clean up your air, clean up your water, clean up your food. And just, you know, clean up your environment. Just those simple things have a massive impact on your health. Yeah. And I also think people seeing uh, like there's a uh, Great Plains, they have a uh, an environmental toxins test, which um, I've used uh, a number of times on myself, on uh, clients who I work with. And it's just so amazing to see the results come in and go, uh, hey, you know, what is your, like, for instance, for me, um, living in Puerto Rico, I'd lived here like uh, about six months or something. And uh, people shoot off fireworks, like all the time. And uh, as it got close to the new year, it was like between Thanksgiving and the new year, it was like every night you would just see like fireworks like crazy. And then the new year's, it was for 20 minutes, just fireworks. You couldn't even see the sky. It was, it was amazing. Then I took the Great Plains environmental toxins test and tested off the chart for, I, for whatever the chemical is in uh, fireworks that's, uh, that's considered an environmental toxin. I tested like off the charts for that thing. Uh, so when you see that and then you start putting the pieces together, you go, oh, okay, these things are real and they have a real impact. And that, that was the urine test you did? Yep. Yeah, well, and that, so detoxification, right? If you acclimatize your urine with minerals, plants, it actually improves your kidney's ability to detoxify. So the fact that you are actually peeing out tons of toxins, it's like, great, you're actually getting stuff out of your system. So as long as you're maximizing detoxification with magnesium, potassium, you know, um, plant-based diet, lots of clean water, mineral water, you know, getting things, healthy fats to help your liver detoxify, you can get exposed to that and kick it out. You know, I'm always concerned when I see patients and I test them, I don't pick up toxins because I'm like, whoa, it's not coming out of your body. And I'll do like a, like a provoke, provoke test where I do like, you know, um, some kind of provoking agent. All of a sudden stuff starts pouring out. Wow. That, that's something I see a lot of. And it's like, whoa, like, 
we need to get you detoxifying. We need to get you sweating more and peeing more and, you know, pooping once or twice a day and, you know, taking deep, even deeper breaths, you know, you know, you know, I was really, I, I do a lot of, you know, biohacking on myself and I have this device that checks VOCs in my house. And so, and CO2 and, you know, carbon monoxide stuff. And so I just breathed on it to see how accurate it was and just look at some things, you know, and I saw my, my VOC levels, you know, skyrocketing. So I started researching. I'm like, oh yes, my body does make volatile, volatile organic compounds in micro, micro, micro doses. If I'm not breathing deeply and breathing it sufficiently, it's going to affect my body's ability to get these things out. And it's interesting how chronic stress lowers your lung volumes. It lowers your tidal volumes. You know, it, it, you can still maintain your oxygen levels, but it affects your lung capacity. And it's interesting how many ancient traditions, um, whether it's Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, um, focus on things like deep breathing is a part of healthy living. And then now in the, the neurological literature, we know deep breathing is a vagal nerve stimulator. It activates your vagal nerve, which balances your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. All of a sudden, it's like something as simple as breathing has crazy health benefits. And what was that, uh, that VOC tool that you use? Um, so you can use a couple of them. There, um, there's a couple of things you want to look at. Personally, I want to look at. I want to look at the um, amount of carbon dioxide in parts per million, <clears throat> typically you want that less than a thousand parts per million. It means your indoor air is actually you know, circulating enough. Um, there's a thing called PM 2.5. There's a PM 2.5 and 10 and 20. And that's basically those microparticulates. Um, there's also um, total VOCs and then uh, formaldehyde. And you can't, I've not been able to find one device that measures all of those. And so I've got two devices that have a little bit of crossover. And so basically you can set up in your house. And it's really interesting to see how the numbers change throughout the day. They change with my kids during the daytime when people are opening and closing doors. The numbers look great. And they look worse first thing in the morning when everybody's been in bed, there's been no windows open and closed. You know, It's interesting just to correlate these things. Um, also, we have an older renovated house and to see how it's different on one side of the house versus the other side of the house. And just to test the device, I took it outside right to see because it would change crazy in my house. But once I put it outside, everything stopped changing because the air outside is equalized, right? So I had to go inside my house to see variation and just kind of verified to me that the technology is accurate, but also just that, wow, like I need to pay attention to these data points, you know? Yeah, totally. That's really good stuff. I, 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 uh, I'm interested to uh, maybe check one of those devices out and, uh, and run those experiments. I'm a big um, data geek, especially since I've been doing things like, uh, you know, I wear the Aura ring, you know, I love like, you know, wearables like that. There you go. Uh, this thing, man, has like, it's, it's implanted like a chip in my brain to be super hypervigilant of like, not sure. just my sleep, but like, I'm talking heart rate, okay. heart rate variability, all these things. I'm going to, Eric, I'm going to um, confess something to you. I was really bad uh, two nights ago. I was a very, very bad boy. Um, before I went to bed, I had a piece, my daughter had a birthday and I had a piece of salted chocolate caramel cake. Woo! A piece of ice cream. I know, I'm sorry. I was, I was so bad. I was very, very naughty. And so I had my aura ring on. And um, it was interesting because I tell patients all the time, don't eat before you go to bed. Don't have sugar, all that kind of, and I'm usually pretty good at this stuff. But it's interesting. The reason I like the day, it was interesting to see. It took me 45 minutes to fall asleep. I didn't realize that. But the aura ring with the movement and the measurement, you know how it works. It took me 45 minutes to fall asleep. And usually, um, if I sleep eight hours, I only get about seven hours of sleep. And an hour, it's kind of coming in and out of sleep, which, again, I don't realize it because I'm, you know, sub, I'm, out, I'm asleep, you know, knocked out. But the night I did that, I lost two extra hours of sleep. So I was in bed for about seven hours. I only got five hours of sleep. And it took me an hour to get to sleep. And you probably know that the most important sleep of the night is how much REM sleep you cycle before midnight. So it was just interesting with the aura ring to see my dad. And I've done this with like, you know, not eating, you know, two hours before I go to bed. Like, it's just interesting how something as simple as eating before you go to bed totally wrecks your sleep-wake cycle because of how it affects your gut. Because your gut's supposed to be detoxifying. It's supposed to be focusing on your liver function. Now making it digest when it's supposed to be doing other functions and how that can affect your sleep wake cycles. So I really do like some of these data because it's really, and I'm the guy who's telling people to do the right stuff. And I'm, of course, I was naughty. I knew I apologize, but it's interesting to see that data and see, wow, like this is real. This is not just a bunch of people geeking out on articles, like, you know, how you, what you eat before you go to bed, how much you eat before these affect, you know, affect the quality of your sleep, which affects like everything, right? 
I mean, yes. <laughs> it, it, like I know this. Uh, I know this world of uh, the aura ring. Like, there's days I won't be good, and then like I'll fall asleep. I try to go to bed, you know, like between nine thirty and ten, and then it says, "Oh, you didn't go to sleep until one in the morning." And it's like, wait, how did that happen? Uh, yeah. Apparently, I wasn't sleeping. Um, you know, so and then I'll feel it the next day, and it's, yeah. uh, you know, I know a lot of people are skeptical of the aura ring. I've heard people kind of complain about some functionality, um, but. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's placebo. Maybe it's real. But like, I know that like when I look at my readiness score, it's pretty spot on to how I feel. Yeah, I think with, with all these technology, and that's where, you know, I always like to, t- you know, I always test things against other technologies. Um, and if you look at the aura ring, not to talk about it too much, but it has the heart rate variability and it has your actual heart rate. And so if you have a good night's rest, what happens is your heart rate variability will go up during the night and the actual heart rate will go down. And so I, I think I think the gyroscope and it might be a little too sensitive because I'll see sometimes where it like shows me waking up a whole bunch, but the whole night long I'm seeing my heart rate go down to as low as 50. I'm seeing my heart rate availability and go up sometimes as much as 120 milliseconds, and those are all markers of quality, restorative, regenerative sleep. But the ring is saying I didn't get enough REM or whatever. So I think like with any of these technologies, they're still in the works. They're still being there's still bugs being worked out, you know. Um, if the aura ring or any of these other ones were the bee's knees, that's all you'd hear about. So that's where I will use different technologies. I've got one ring that like measures my pulse ox as well. Problem with that is if I knock it off, it tells me I'm dying. I'm not dying, you know. So it's just, I think all these things, you have to gauge them against how you feel. And for me, brain function the following day, other technologies. And ultimately, you know, um, there's still a lot of gaps with the accuracy of some of these things. Agreed. I, I totally agree. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's with any of this information, it's it's not medical advice. It's not talking to your doctor. It's it's basically like here's like a, a pretty good ballpark idea of where you are. Um, and it's also you don't want to get you don't want to miss the forest through the trees. You want to kind of look at the overall trends. And, you know, um, again, like maybe it missed a night or two of like, Hey, it, uh, some inaccurate readings. I know for me, like I get a lot of white spots in the aura ring readings, but, um, overall, like if it says, Hey, I'm in 80 or above readiness, I feel great that day. If I'm, you know, I've had some days where it's like, I'll wake up and it's like, dude, <laughs> you did not do well yesterday. What happened to you? And, uh, and I got a failing grade on the readiness score. Um, I'll feel it. I'll feel like it. And, uh, you know, it's funny because years ago that would have just been normal for me. Right. That like that kind of like low level, uh, energy, low level, like whatever. It's like, Oh, it's just another day. Ah, it's a crappy Monday. But now I can look at that and I go, Oh, well, something is affecting my heart rate. Something's affecting my deep sleep. Something is affecting my body temperature. You know, what could that be? So this information is good. Well, Dr. Hartman, this has been a, a very fun interview. I really appreciate your time. Um, for the Holistic Nootropics listeners who'd like to, uh, you know, check out more of your work or maybe contact you, where's a good place for them to go online to find you? And the best place is just our practice website, which is richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. Um, that's like the landing page for our com- online community, um, for um, all of our social media stuff. I do um, um, some blog posting that all these articles are on the educational tab. I'm trying to create the website as like an educational resource for people who want, like there's a reading list there, books I've read that I think would be useful for people. So I just, if people want to learn more about me or functional medicine in general, that's what I'm kind of setting my website up for. Or even even like where you're at in Puerto Rico, for example, you know, is there a functional practitioner there? Um, and so I, with the community I've set up, you know, we have a health coach. I've got myself doing education. And then um, a nurse practitioner kind of helping my community online just to kind of get educated and take charge of their health. So all those resources are available on our website, richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. Awesome. And, you know, when we release this, I'll go ahead and put all that into the show notes so people will be able to find you, find your website. Um, Otherwise, this has been a great time. Listener, thank you so much for, for listening and watching on YouTube. Be sure to check out Dr. Hartman online. And for more info on all things biohacking, nootropics, and nutrition, be sure to check out holisticnootropics.com. We'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.